Imagine life as you know it today. All your studying, all your hard work, reaching your goals, and everything is snatched away. Overnight, you have no say in how it happens, it's gone. In 2011, like many of you, I watched as the situation in Syria, the humanitarian crisis, unfolded in front of me. I was puzzled as to why it was a big problem getting aid <coughs> into Syria. What was the problem with delivering medical and humanitarian aid? As a mother, I can identify and remember the times when I would dry in between my children's toes with a cotton bud, making sure that they wouldn't get sick, researching schools, helping them when they're choosing university, doing the best that you can for your children. That's been taken away from the women in Syria. Towards the end of 2011, I, I found it more difficult to just sit by and watch what was happening. I wanted to know what the big deal with was, you know, why could we not get aid into Syria? Why could we do it every place else, but we couldn't manage to do it in Syria? I researched a charity and I found Hand in Hand for Syria and understood that they delivered aid directly into Syria. Well, how could they do that? Because nobody else is doing it. Because they could. Well, do they take any commission, like when people donate? What, what goes to the people in Syria? 100%. So how does it work? Because they work with people that are passionate and committed to the cause. I had a friend, a male friend, that approached me in 2012, and he kind of shuffled around really nervously and said, sister, I've had a call from Syria. They urgently need women's things. So I said to him, what do you mean? They, he's a father. You know, I was really shocked at his reluctance to speak to me. I said, what do you mean by women's things? And he lowered his gaze and kind of moved around a bit and said, you know, stuff for women. <laughs> so I, I said to him, do you mean sanitary towels? And he lowered his gaze and said, yes. I went away that night and I couldn't stop thinking about something so basic. I'd heard about the rape cases over there. I remember what it was like as a young teenager getting my periods, being a mother. You know, it's part of life. And I just couldn't imagine not having access to stuff like that. We had a meeting, and I've got to say, most of the people that were at that meeting were students. We sat down and we said, what can we do? We need to do something, what can we do? We said, we can do a convoy to Syria. And they were, how can you do a convoy? Because we can. We started fundraising, and I was amazed at how many people got on board. Through the charity, we managed to purchase 12 ambulances, and it left the UK for Syria. All of that was achieved in a month. There was medical aid, urgent medical aid on there, nappies, baby milk, warm clothes, and sanitary towels. <laughs> the convoy took off, and I actually flew from the UK out to Turkey to, to meet the convoy. I, I wanted to go into Syria and deliver it by my hand, because I totally respect the culture if there is a shyness there and wanted to make sure that we were being respectful of it and another female colleague came with me. As we approached the Syrian border from Turkey from a distance it looked like a really beautiful sight. It looked like there was lots of mountains covered in snow cap, in snow, but actually when we got closer I realized it was a sea of tents. There was an area that had had a population of 5,000 people, and at that time it had 45,000 people. The contrast between Turkey and Syria is a really, really, it's as strong as night and day. You walk in and you see just the sheer enormity of the amount of people that are displaced in there. You see women walking with 
their everything in their hands, be that their children, the clothes that they can manage. Many of them have walked for hundreds of miles. I'd heard about an incredible lady who was a midwife and was actually delivering babies on her kitchen floor because that was the only place they had to deliver them. Now imagine 45,000 people. I went to meet her and what an inspirational lady she was. We spoke, she, we even laughed at some of the funny moments that she'd experienced, but she explained to me that women in Syria were walking in to, the, to her kitchen with nothing more than the clothes they had. There's no little labor bag, there is no underwear for them, there's no nappies for their children, there is no blankets to take them home in. They walked in in what they stood up in. It was quickly established we needed some kind of center. I'm really pleased to tell you that on the positive side, we've now got a women's hospital that are delivering children. We, there is also several children's hospitals. We went a little bit further into Syria and we met an, a, a family that was about 45 people strong. We went a little bit further in because the further in you go to Syria, the harder it is because aid isn't getting in there. We saw approximately 45 people, which I discovered was actually an extended family. Because families are quite big there, so you have the grandma, the uncle. Most of them were women and children. The children were covered in cots because they're not used to living outside. I asked them where they sleep at night, and they showed me a room that was probably about four square meters. No electricity, no running water, and neatly in the corner was a little stack of blankets. I, I, I couldn't understand how they could sleep in there at the same time. We took a list of what their most urgently needed aid was and promised to return as we'd seen three heavily pregnant members of the family. A couple of days later, we did go back with ambulances filled with aid and they couldn't believe we'd come back. But the first sight that greeted me was an old lady that was at least 80 years old. And just to give you an example of how resourceful women are, she had a little metal contraption that was about that high from the floor and she was cooking bread on it. She ran towards me and she was giving us the bread. I didn't want to take the bread because I didn't think they had anything else to eat. I was very aware it could be the last piece of food. But Syrian culture is very, very warm and she insisted I take the bread. We were able to hand over nappies, baby packs and food basic things that the children needed. We went a little bit further inside Syria, approximately 80 kilometers, and came to a village that had been destroyed. We had two ambulances full of aid. We unloaded the aid. I mentioned I have some women's things here. I was directed over to a door. It was in a mosque. I opened the door and I could see the room, the, the, the floor full. It was quite dark, so if you can just imagine, it's quite dimly lit and women looking up, they were sitting down and we mentioned what we'd brought for them. If we had have brought them gold, they couldn't have been happier. When I, on my return to the UK, I was interviewed by <coughs> BBC Women's Hour and they asked me to give some examples of the type of aid we'd delivered. I mentioned the taboo word of sanitary towels, and the reaction from the UK was absolutely amazing. Women really wanted to help women. We decided within the charity that we'd set up aid drops. We'd done our first one in August of this year and had 27 points across the UK. And guess what was on the list? We put down sanitary towels. But we had a working group where we were working with Syrian and English, male and females. When we said sanitary towels, the, the, the guys would usually... Urgh. But we were like, you know what, it's a fact of life. This could be your mother, your sister. They need it, that's it. Are we going to go public with it? Absolutely, we're going to go public with it. And it was really, really successful. We've just launched our last one, and it had over 40 collection points across the UK. And we had sanitary towels on there again. I should point out... There are far, the list is long of what they need in Syria. But this is just to give you a tiny example of things that we use every day. Two really good things happened from this. Towards the end of the project, <coughs> when we were talking about you need to pack it up and label it up, we put it in containers, the guys were asking us, so Iman, what's the difference? Like, what do wings mean? What are tampons? <laughs> What's the difference between ultra-absorbent? 
what are panty liners? And they actually packed all of those, Syrian guys packed all of those into boxes and seven containers left the UK for Syria. Now with all this talking about wings, etc., what I'd really like to say to you is that I actually believe that we are the people that clip our own wings. How can we inspire our children or other people and tell them, you can be whatever you want to be, the sky is your limit. If you restrict yourself and you find obstacles to put in front of you, you're only hurting yourself. Women are extremely resourceful, tolerant and strong. And I agree, we do need to be able to work with men. But we can learn from each other. So ending that note, I would say to you, I'm actually honoured and blessed to have been able to go into Syria to do what I wanted to do. But if, if you would have asked me five years ago, will you be hot-footing it across a field in Syria and delivering sanitary towels and talking on national TV and radio about them, I would have told you no. So the lesson learned is every single person can make a difference, but more importantly, you can be part of that difference. Thank you.